well, God must like you. You don't hang out in sin salon. You don't slink along dead end road. You don't go to smart mouth college. Instead, you thrill to God's word. You chew on scripture day and night. You're a tree replanted by Eden. Very fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf. Always in blossom. You're not at all like the wicked who are mere windblown dust. Without defense in court, unfit company for innocent people. God charts the road you take. The road they take is skin road. Let us stand and sing together. Psalm 1 from the King James Version. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water, that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like chaff, which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Would you stand with me as we sing a song that speaks of this scripture in today's message? I'll take Blessed is the man 
who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I want you to think of a time, if you will, um, because cynicism is one of the things we're talking about today. Obviously I don't really want you to become a cynic, but if you do want to, I'm going to show you how. Uh, but opposite, I want to talk to you about joy. Uh, so I want you right now, think about a time that you experienced joy. Now immediately something comes to mind, but I'm going to put some qualifiers on it. Think of a time you experienced joy before you graduated high school. It could be related to a person, an event, a season of life, an object, some kind of revelation. Uh, but something other than your direct salvation uh, or related birth and somebody's birth in your family, those are obvious, right? Or those things that are directly related, related to the things of Christ in your life. Think of a time before you graduated high school, you might have been a young child, junior high, high school, when you experienced joy. Okay? Something come to mind? For some of you, many things come to mind. Now, kind of get in twos or threes or even four, and I'd like you to share those. So some of you might have to move around a little bit. But share that experience of joy with the others, if you would. <laughs> I basically just asked you to share an experience of joy outside direct impact from God, but there's a little problem with that because our source of joy is God. That's where true joy comes from. That doesn't mean there's not enjoyable experiences that we have or times that we're happy, whether we know Jesus or not. Everybody has those kinds of times. But deep abiding joy comes from our Lord and God. Um, that, that joy that even in the midst of tragedy, sorrow, grief, that we can still have that underlying joy. I want you to think about uh, people who live during a time of slavery. Think about the slaves. Think about the music that came from the slaves. It was filled with joy and a, and a future hope looking forward that even when they were treated as <coughs> property, they still had this underneath foundation of joy which came from God. And so we too, even when things are not going well, um, we can still experience that joy that comes only from God. Now the opposite of joy is not being glum, oh hum. Um, the opposite of joy, I would say, is even a sin. Even if it's named, the, the opposite of joy, an ep epidemic among people today. Even, even Christians don't, are not exempt from this one. In fact, probably all of us experience this to one degree or another. Uh, and the sin is spelled even with the word sin. Cynicism. S-I-N-I-C-ism. S-I-N-I-C-ism. Cynicism. There's a guy named Boyd Ogilvy. He's an author. He's written a lot of books. He's worked on a number of commentaries. Uh, I've always enjoyed his work, kind of his point of view and the way he presents things. He talked about a friend in one of his books. And this uh, friend was just one of those people who just loved to have a church as a pastor, who just serves in lots of different ways, very gifted, great wife and family, you know, fairly well off, not wealthy, but, but well enough that he can take care of family needs and give to the church and all those kinds of things. And always there, very loyal, very faithful. And, 
Then Lloyd uh, had looked back on a time when he noticed that um, he missed a couple Sundays in a row. Then he would miss a month. Then he would only come about once a month. And then after a couple years, he realized that his friend wasn't coming to church at all. And so he gave him a call and said, can we go uh, to coffee? And they went and sat down and he said, gosh, I just really miss you. I miss relationship with you and miss seeing you at church. What's, what's going on? Are you going somewhere else? I said, no. He said, my wife told me she's going to leave me unless I change. Unless I change my attitude and the words that come out of my mouth. Unless I stop being so negative and critical of everybody and everything around me, including her. Lloyd was a little shocked. He'd never heard that one before. There are a lot of reasons that spouses say, I'm going to leave you, but uh, you don't hear that one very often. Most of us, if that kind of stuff goes on in a relationship, we put up with it and we fight back or somehow we figure out how to work that out. But she was going to leave him. And he said, well, what happened? You, you, you know, I've never noticed that in you, but you know, I haven't seen you for a long time either. And as he talked with his friend, Lloyd kind of figured out what went on. His friend had gotten a new job. And in his old job, everybody there were um, just very positive people. And this new job, everybody was negative and cynical about everything. If the copier went down, it was an attack against the person using it. In other words, the copier was mad at you, so it wasn't going to work right. So you'd say negative and bad things about the copier because you were a victim of how poorly this copier was working. Just everything just became uh, so negative around him. And at first, he tried being the positive influence for them when he was there. And then after a while, he just kind of acquiesced and he didn't say anything, but he didn't join in with them either. And then after another few months, he was starting to say the same kinds of negative things that they were. He became a part of his culture, his new culture, this new job after a time, and he was just as cynical and negative as they were, and then he started taking that home and everywhere else, and all of a sudden the church was doing everything wrong, um, people were wearing the wrong clothes, they were singing the wrong songs, just everything, nothing that he complained about before, now all of a sudden uh, was, was negative and he was cynical, cynical about his wife and his kids, um, and you know, misery loves company, and so does cynicism, that critical people want to pull others with them just to affirm that the way they're seeing life is the right way to see it. If you know anybody like that, have you ever been like that? That you just, for whatever reason, you've just gotten critical about things. Again, I think we've all been there uh, at one time or another to different degrees. Even, even the most joyful of us uh, have fallen into this sin. Well, for those of you who are not cynical, uh, the Bible tells you how to become cynical in Psalm 1. And so uh, if you're on you version, you can follow these. If not, you can just listen. There are three steps to becoming cynical. Okay, so if you want to become cynical, anyone but they want to become cynical besides Mike Edgeberry? <laughs> so this is how you can become more cynical. Okay, Mike. Uh, three steps that the scripture gives us. Uh, the first one is take your eyes off Jesus and walk in the counsel of the wicked. If you want to become cynical, negative, everything in life is wrong, you're a victim, walk in the counsel of the... Listen to what wicked people are saying. Follow their judgments and, the, and their oh, attitudes. Walk in the counsel of the wicked. The Hebrew word is, for wicked is rasha. It also means ungodly. Walk in the counsel of the ungodly. People who live horizontally, who have no interest in God, so we can't blame them. All right? They don't have a relationship with Christ. They, they don't know God. And so their life is like this, and they see everything as negative and wrong. And you can go ahead and listen to their counsel for your life, and you can become like them too. Okay, that's step number one. Step number two, change direction and stand in the way or in the path of sinners. That Hebrew word is hata. This is worse than the ungodly. These are people who claim to have a relationship with God, yet choose to live by wrong values, words, and conduct. If walking with the ungodly affects our thinking, standing with sinners 
affects our behavior. Now, don't get me wrong as I'm talking about this. This never says that we should not spend time with sinners or the wicked or the ungodly. In fact, we must. Uh, we must befriend them and we must share Christ with them. Okay, so that they too will know what we know. So this isn't talking about that part. This is talking about that's your main state. That's, that's who your group is that you take counsel from. And when it says stand in the way of, it doesn't mean block them. It means stand in the way that they go. Live in the way that they go. In other words, you know God too, but I'm going to live like I'm a sinner. I'm going to say I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to live like a sinner in that negativity, in that cynicism. And the third step, uh, uh, God, give me to society and sit in the seat of mockers. The Hebrew is leetsum for mockers. This is the worst form of cynicism. This is those who oppose God's way or mock his ways. Every negative event that happens is just proof for them that God does not love us. 9-11, a school shooting, um, your car breaks down when you have to get somewhere fast to help somebody. Oh, well, God doesn't love me and God doesn't love them. So, ha, ha see, God isn't real. God isn't loving. God doesn't care. My, my mother got cancer. Whatever it is, whatever those negative things in life are, that's just proof for uh, the mocker, for the mocker of God. See, God is not who God says God is. And you know people like this, do you not? And maybe sometimes you feel like that. Does God really love us? Bad things happen to good people. Is God really real? Is there, if he was, and if he were loving, those things wouldn't happen. So those get to be proof for the mocker. So you have the one who doesn't have a relationship with God, and they just have live by their own ways and see the world from negative lenses. You have the ones who have some kind of relationship with God, but choose to walk in the path of sinners. And then you have those who oppose God or who deny his love for us. And so there are, um, there are some solutions also in this text. Uh, three of them. The first one, I don't know if it exactly comes from the text or not. This, this is one way uh, that you can combat cynicism or negativity. Having trouble living right? Headed down the wrong path? Struggling to break old habits? I can do this all night. What you need is a good slap. Who are you? I'm your new Extreme Accountability Partner. Is there anything you'd like to tell me? Get out of my house? What you've been watching? It's the History Channel. There's no naked people on the History Channel. At SLAP, Extreme Accountability isn't just a job, it's an obsession. That's why we designed our patented Gentle Correction Slap Gun. How's that gentle? It's not a fist. What are your intentions with Lindsay? Sure, we've been known to go overboard on occasion. I just met her. We're just eating ice cream with the rest of our small group. But our philosophy is it's better to go overboard okay. than underboard. What was that for? Um, gluttony. Strict lockdown accountability partners for all your extreme accountability needs. Don't like the way you're looking at her, Tom. That's my sister. Oh. Does she have a boyfriend? You got me. I deserve that one. If you're having trouble changing your ways, you might just need a good slap. We love our clients too much to let them ruin their lives. And believe me when I say that our gentle correction hurts us more than it hurts our clients. Most of the time. So there's one way uh, you can fight cynicism. And, and negativity is you can become a part of the SWAT team. Or we can look at scripture. Choice is yours. And it has two cures for cynicism. Number one is read, the, read and study the Bible. It's in verse 2 of Psalm 1. Read and study the Bible. It says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The righteous person 
meditates on God's Word. Over the last couple of weeks, we did something experimenting with meditating on His Word, where I've asked you to close your eyes and simply listen to God's Word. Um, somebody asked me recently about what my process is for sermon preparation. How do I work on a sermon? And the very first thing, and I taught this when I uh, taught the seminary a couple months ago, is that whatever the text is for the sermon, I do what we call live the sermon. Another word might be meditate on, on, the, on the, or the scripture. Live the scripture. Um, I take it and I read it several times quietly, then I read it aloud. I might walk around reading it instead of just sitting, because you just get a kind of a different perspective, but over and over. And I just sit quiet after I've read it. And sometimes if I have it in audio version, I'll close my eyes and listen to it. And then um, I'll, I'll begin to ask it questions. I ask the scripture questions. Why is this here? Who is involved in this story? What is the point of it? Why did you say that, Jesus? And I'll just meditate on that. And then I may go to some extra sources, but, but I'll spend several days just doing that part of it. Sometimes I'll never get to extra sources. Sometimes I need help. That, that I don't understand something or it doesn't become clear to me by just meditation um, or just asking a question. So I'll go to some other sources. But, but we all need to spend more time just meditating on God's Word. That's a cure for cynicism, because God's word is powerful in you. It lifts you. It makes you a more devoted follower of him and closer to him. And of course, that's going to begin to get rid of negative, cynical attitudes, thoughts, and words that come out of your mouth and fill you with greater joy. And the second thing, God provides all the resources we need. We sometimes think that we have to do something to get better at something in our lives. Well, in this case, for joy and to combat cynicism, God provides you everything you need. Verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The very first time I flew into Twin Falls, I noticed there were not a lot of trees. And I thought about it recently. If people didn't live here, how many trees would there be? <laughs> Zero. If there were, they would be where? They would be down in the canyon by where there is a water source. Um, because trees need water to grow, and the person filled with joy is one who is planted close to God and draws his resource from this big river of living water. And so his leaves never wither and fall off. I have two cedar trees in my backyard. They never lose all of their pine needles. They just stay on all day. Uh, they get a little brownish during the winter. They kind of go to sleep, but they stay there. And then in the spring, they not only green up, but they ripen up and more of them grow. And so when we're planted by the stream of God, when we're in his presence regularly, we can't help but have cynicism overcome in our lives and experience more joy. So you can either... Start slapping people around, or have yourself slapped around, or live according to Scripture. Delight in His Word, and live in His presence, and allow Him to be your source of joy. Living in His Word brings joy. Living water to a parched soil, soul, that is what produces joy. And there's even a Scripture in a song about His Word turning into joy. So if you haven't followed it, this enough so far, watch what this scripture does. It takes God's word, so as you read it, as you apply it, as you meditate on it, it turns into joy in your life. Isaiah 55, 10 through 12. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the ewe, so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Talking about his word. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you. And all the trees of the field, those that are by that living water, 
those that are by those streams and drink from it daily will clap, will clap their hands. Let's stand and sing that scripture through the song. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy and all the trees of Son's house, 
And we got up early and we drove to Port Clinton, Ohio, which is on the lake, Lake Erie. And we hopped on a little plane and took the seven minute flight over to South Bass Island or Putin Bay. Uh, then we were gonna try to call a cab and the pilot said, oh, take my car, it's over there, it's got the keys in it. He goes, take it for the day. I'm not gonna be using it. Okay. Well, we couldn't get off the island, we couldn't steal it. There's no ferry boats running because there's ice on the lake. Oh, and on our way over, we, Nathan and I want to take pictures because there's places of ice and there's places of water and all kinds of neat stuff going on. And uh, he said, oh, I've got to take some potato chips over too. In other words, the only way to get stuff to the island is by airplane. Well, he didn't meet a couple bags of potato chips. They packed this plane. So Nathan sat in the cockpit with the pilot. I sat in the one seat that was available, just kind of squished, and there were nothing but boxes all around me <laughs> except this window over here. So I couldn't see a lot, and I terrified the pilot because I took the top box in front of me. I thought, if I take these top boxes off and put them in my lap, I can see more. And he thought, the, like, the plane was falling apart because he saw these boxes start moving and everything. Um, and we wanted to go by our house, which is just around from where the airport is. And, and we asked him, and he said, sure. Well, for me to see it, I had to look out my little window, and the G-forces of his turning so fast uh, were just awful. We, both of us, Nathan and I, got almost sick. But uh, we did that. Uh, we checked out our place. We had some problems last winter. My brothers thought one of us owners should go, and they paid for me to go. Uh, we spent the night on the mainland, and then we went to see uh, some of my mom's old places that she went. Went to the library, saw some of the history of my family. It was really cool. And then we went to the cemetery where her ashes are buried in Oak Harbor, Ohio. Uh, and I had thought beforehand, before going there, that I might ask my son to have just a moment alone. My son is so perceptive, I didn't even have to do that, standing there. And he goes, Dad, let me give you a minute. And he went back to the car. And I began to weep. Now, I miss my mom every day, but I usually don't weep over that. In fact, I'm not much of a crier in general. But I just stood there looking at her name on that tombstone, knowing that her ashes were buried there, and knowing how much I missed her, and I just wept. And yet, in the same moments, I experienced joy. In the midst of my mourning and my sorrow and my grief, I had joy thinking about what a great life she had, um, how blessed I am to have had her as my mother, and the joy of knowing that I will see her again someday. So even in the midst of my sorrow and my grief, I was also experiencing joy. The unbeliever can't do that. The unbeliever just gets cynical. Look, there is no God. This person has died and they're out of my life. Why didn't he let them live? For me, I understand. There is a day, but he will return and bring us home to glory. And we'll see each other again. John chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. Disciples, the, the world's going to be glad that I'm gone. You're going to be sorrowful that I'm gone. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. Let me explain it to you, Jesus says. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. It hurts to give birth to a child. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you rejoice. And no one, no thing, will take away your joy. We do not have to live in cynicism and negativity that the world lives in. We can rise above that, and we can help lift them up, and we don't have to join in with them. And we can live our lives by His Word, planted by His streams, knowing that He's coming again in great joy. Do you know Jesus? If you don't, you can't experience lasting joy. You can experience momentary happiness, but it comes and goes with your circumstances. But to truly know joy, you need have a relationship with God, and that only comes through knowing Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And if you have none, but He's become real to you today, 
I invite you to make that certain in your life. Come forward as we sing this closing song. Come into our prayer room and let somebody pray with you. Tell them, say, Jesus revealed himself to me today, and I want to know that joy the pastor talked about. They'd love to pray with you. If you have any other prayer requests or praises, you'd like to come and just kneel here at the front by yourself, or you want to just pray with somebody in the prayer room. Come for either one. Ask the Holy Spirit to fall fresh on you today with joy.
ever dare to ask or even dream of. Infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, and hopes. Now glory be to God through the church, through Jesus Christ throughout all generations, both now and forever. And all those filled with God's joy say,